Um, so going straight into it, um, it's, I think it's really ironical. In 1999, some of our South Black sisters and others had achieved this incredible seminal moment in the history of struggles uh, of Asian women against violence and other forms of harm. Uh, when we forced the government um, to reject or to think again, reflect, review its policies on multiculturalism, which effectively meant non-state intervention in the affairs of uh, minority families. And uh, we achieved this moment when the Home Office um, junior minister, Mike O'Brien, said, multiculturalism sensitiv sensitivities are no excuse for moral blindness. I thought it was a really significant moment. It's very much tied up to the history of feminist struggles by black minority women in this country. The irony is that at 2015, we find ourselves back where we started, except the situation's a lot worse. Um, austerity measures, together with regressive notions of religion, has replaced culture um, and become the main marker of identity. And this is impacting on the way in which legal and welfare systems are responding to minority women's needs in particular. Because at the core of the legal and welfare uh, functions is a moral blindness. Um, and for me, working um, in an organization that also provides frontline services, we really have reached a crisis point um, in terms of the struggle for access to justice. What we see is neoliberal um, developments and the continuing rise of religious fundamentalist identity politics coming together. And they've left us um, struggling on two interlinked fronts. First, we are absolutely compelled to challenge the legal aid cuts, which are having a hugely devastating impact on the women that we see, but also very many other vulnerable groups. And I cannot tell you that in the last few weeks alone, I have witnessed a suicide and a homicide as a result of the services that are being cut back and the legal aid uh, that's basically rolled back completely. One of the great pillars of the of the welfare state absolutely being destroyed, and it is heartbreaking, both at an individual level, but also in terms of our ability to hold institutions to account for abuses of power. Um, so we are really, really having to fight tooth and nail um, against those kinds of legal aid cuts, not necessarily with success. But this development is also linked to another challenge that we face, which is increasing privatization of justice and the state adoption of faith-based approach to address minority issues. And that's, I'm coming now to the way in which religious fundamentalists, moderates particularly, and they're not moderate on women's issues, let me tell you, who are using the vacuum that's created by the state withdrawing its welfare and legal functions to influence and shape law and social policy by reference to regressive religious identity that they've come to define. So we've seen the demand, for example, recently in the UK uh, for the accommodation of religious legal codes in the very fabric of the legal system. Um, demands that come from very powerful Muslim spokespersons, but not just limited. And we know that if they are allowed to succeed, other religions will follow. What's happened is that the fundamentalists, Muslim fundamentalists, have really attempted a two-pronged movement based on trying to normalize personal religious codes within the legal system itself. And they've done it in two ways. One is to infiltrate the actual legal system to see greater accommodation of religion in the law. And the other is to formalize a parallel legal system through the establishment of alternative religious forums for dispute resolution, particularly for family matters. And I call this process the shariafication by stealth of the legal apparatus. Um, it involves making state law and policy Sharia compliant. Um, and if successful, you know, it, it will be not only detrimental for women, but it will be detrimental for other minorities too. We've seen one example of sharification by stealth and the way the Chris spoke about the universities, uh, UK, 
and the guidance on gender segregation, which we were involved in, um, along with Chris and others, campaigning against using the equalities legislation. The other example of the challenge that we've recently mounted is against the Law Society, because last year, the year before, the Law Society was quite proudly um, and, and prominently displaying guidance to solicitors, all their legal members, on how to draw up Sharia compliant wills. And those Sharia compliant wills absolutely reminded lawyers to take note that in Sharia principles, according to Sharia principles, women are worth half of men and illegitimate children cannot inherit. So you can imagine these very misogynistic, patriarchal, sexist um, uh, values absolutely being embedded by a law society that should be rights com promoting a rights compliant culture, actually promoting a uh, patriarchal misogynist culture. And we had to challenge that, and we did so by using the equalities legislation, uh, again, trying to mount a legal challenge on the basis of uh, violations of equalities duties and also human rights. But we also mounted a political campaign involving the National Secular Society, um, uh, students, and others, and won. Really, really absolutely um, amazed that what happened at the end of 2013 was that Law Society not only withdrew its guidance, but actually issued a public apology, which we didn't expect. Um, and when we have a situation here where on the one hand, the state itself is mounting an assault on human rights laws and equalities legislation and the mechanisms like judicial review mechanisms that we have to hold the state to account. So on the one hand, it's shrinking all of that. And on the other hand, we have fundamentalists encroaching on secular legal frameworks, um, which are not perfect by any means. They're racist, they uphold racist, sexist, um, homophobic norms too. But nevertheless, there are, far, um, there are far more many mechanisms to hold, imperfect as it is, the legal state system to account than it is to hold the fundamentalists to account who want to actually rule according to divine law, which by its very nature um, is not uh, open to scrutiny. So really, um, in conclusion, what I, what I um, should say is that we have to guard against, we have to be vigilant against these developments and, and, and guard against them. And we have done so in, in moments of incredible hostility. We're accused of being racist. We're accused of being Islamophobic, um, not only by um, you know, parts of the left, but even some feminists and anti-racists when we rage, when we um, make these, um, when we um, wage these campaigns. But painful and intimidating, th th though this sometimes is, I don't think it can deter us, because what we're seeing here is an attempt to impede the development of secular, progressive political resistance by le delegitimizing and locating our struggles for access to justice outside of so-called community, anti-racist, and feminist concerns. And I think these struggles are taking place on many fronts, um, but we have to remain ever vigilant and we have to use whatever spaces we have to challenge um, this kind of encroachment and to, at the same time, uh, force the state to also account for, it, for the wrongs that it's doing. Thank you.